Hello, I am Leslie Anderson. I'm the Director of Collections, Exhibitions, and Programs here at the National Nordic Museum in Seattle. Welcome to this virtual exhibition talk, which coincides with the opening of the experimental self, Edvard Munch's photography at the National Nordic Museum. If your plans allow, please do visit this wonderful exhibition, which was organized by the American Scandinavian Foundation Scandinavia House in partnership with the Munch Museum in Oslo. It was originally presented at Scandinavia House, the Nordic Center in America from November 21st, 2017 until April 7th, 2018. And its West Coast debut at the National Nordic Museum begins today, October 29th. It will be on view until January 31st of 2021. I would like to thank our exhibition sponsor, People's Bank. The exhibition is also presented in memory of Eldon Nysother. I'm thrilled to introduce today's speaker, the exhibition's curator and all around superb art historian, Dr. Patricia Berman. And you'll have the opportunity to ask questions after the talk, um, but feel free to enter them into the chat function of Zoom. Dr. Patricia Berman is an art historian specializing in the art and visual culture of the late 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries. Her research interests include turn of the 20th century European art, especially in Scandinavia, and mid-century modern American painting and photography. She is particularly interested in national identity formation, issues of gender and sexuality, and in the problems of public space. Her books include studies of the artists Edvard Munch and James Enser, and of Danish painting in the 19th century. And her exhibition catalogs include studies of gestural drawing, Andy Warhol, and a look back at the Scandinavian art exhibition that toured the United States in 1912 and 13. She holds the Theodora L. and Stanley H. Feldberg Chair at Wellesley College, where she teaches the intro course to art history. And, um, as well as surveys of modern art, contemporary art, and the history of photography and upper level seminars, including propaganda and persuasion, the Bauhaus, nationalisms and modern art, installation art, and protest art. The Davis Museum at Wellesley is a critical part of her teaching. From 2010 to 2015, she held a faculty position at the University of Oslo, where she also facilitated the research network titled Edvard Munch, Modernism and Modernity. Dr. Berman, welcome. Leslie, thank you so much for that gracious introduction. I do wanna begin with a couple of words of gratitude and actually as a, a visitor um, in Seattle, I wanna acknowledge that we're on the traditional land of the first people of Seattle, uh, the Duwamish people past and present, and I honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish tribe. I next wanna honor Leslie Anderson uh, and her colleagues here at the Nordic Museum for the collaboration, the hospitality, the technical support, and um, really for such an excellent and um, elegant installation. The experimental self, Edvard Munch's uh, photography began as an exhibition at Scandinavia House in New York in 2017. This is now its sixth venue. And I'm grateful to the Munch Museum for the loan of these photographs and thanks Scandinavia House uh, for the exhibition. I also want to honor the foundational research into Munch's photography by Arne Egham, uh, Cecilia Thierry Holt, and Clément Charroux, who have all written extraordinarily about this work. And finally, I want to thank the Munch Museum for new, this newly published volume that you see on the screen. It's a book that just literally arrived today, accompanying the experimental self exhibition um, and is available here at the gift shop at the museum. Now the exhibition consists of 46 photographs and short film fragments made by Munch. And I think they're revelatory to an audience that might know Munch's paintings and prints, but is unaware that he also played with lens-based media. He's notable, for example, for being one of the very first artists to explore what we consider the modern selfie. And I'm showing you two examples here. Uh, by viewing the photographs, we get um, at least two insights into the private life of this artist. Uh, the first insight is that we get a privileged view of this hardworking, very public artist in his moments away from public view. Monk's photographs, um, were not exhibited in his lifetime, 
and must be considered therefore to be the private and formal works of an amateur picture taker. The photographs actually are really, really tiny. They're all about two and a half by two and a half inches or two and a half by three inches. And most of them uh, are exactly like old family uh, snapshots that you may have at home. Um, but um, it's important, I think, that these small informal amateur photographs um, have to be seen also as extraordinarily inventive. The artist had a discerning eye for detail and a constant drive to innovate and push boundaries of every medium that he encountered in painting and in printmaking and also in his lens-based media. And I offer here the opportunity <clears throat> to think about the little amateur photographs, not as sources for his more public work, but little experimental arenas to extend his material exploration in painting and printmaking into photography. And at the end of this talk, I'll show you a little bit of his films, his cinema. Monk was active with his camera from 1902 to 1910, and then again from 1927 into the early 1930s. And let me quickly point out that um, even in a kind of scruffy image, like the one you see on the right-hand side of your screen of one of Monk's housekeepers, rather playful and interesting things happen. The first is that we note that the foreground of the composition, again, I'm talking about the photograph on the right-hand side of the screen, that the foreground of the composition is taken up by a tabletop, which was obviously used to stabilize his camera. It takes up a full third of the composition. And as we'll see, this is a strategy that probably derived from a formal accident in 1902, which you see on the left, one of his first photographs, when he laid his camera on a table. Um, in a photograph of himself taken with a couple of friends in 1904 at the center of the screen. And then again, that in this photograph of the housekeeper, the occluded foreground had become a formal device to be played with by the artist. It's therefore uh, both a device to sort of interrupt our visual field in the same way that he often used paint or other or print media to interrupt our visual field of his motifs. He'd often deployed techniques to interrupt our ways of seeing, such as his painted sick child from 1884 to 86. And I'm not saying that the informal photograph of his housekeeper and this breakthrough painting in which Munch had reconstituted a memory of his sister's death from, a previous, uh, from previous years is equivalent. But what I am saying is that from his earliest practice, the artist was interested in playing with the surfaces of his works, calling attention to their materiality and their capacities for both offering motifs and simultaneously to be read as paint, as material, as stuff. A detail from the sick girl over here, or the sick child over here on the right-hand side of the screen reminds us that the artist scraped his paint surfaces, creating cracks and fissures overpainted, made little valleys, and then created brush strokes onto the surface, interrupting the visual unity of the scene, but enhancing its emotional impact. Similarly, Munch understood the dynamics of photographic possibilities by his later photographic career. So the table interrupts the scene and it allows us through its surface to see not one, but four versions of his housekeeper who's so patiently and kindly standing before the camera. She stands before us in, in the flesh, so to speak, and is also reflected on the table surface right below her. Now, Monk seems to have moved a lamp behind her in the hallway of his home, and you can sort of see the electric plug snaking around the door frame. This lighting casts a shadow of the woman onto the door to her left, and which is also reflected in the tabletop below her. Um, so actually, if you take the time to look at these tiny little photographs of Munch, you note that he's playing with reflections and shadows all the time. Um, and here we see this woman, her mirrored reflection, her shadow, and the mirrored reflection of the shadow simultaneously. We see four people. And I think this artist had the insight to understand photography itself as a shadow collecting medium. But I get ahead of myself a little bit. I'm gonna give a little bit of biography 
Munk was born in Norway in 1863, and he died after a long life of breathtaking productivity in 1944 during the Nazi occupation of his home country. He's of course best known for this painting, The Scream, first created in 1893, and by now an image that has become one of the most recognizable and usable political motifs over its long lifetime. So with The Scream alone, Munch has remained vital and famous as an image maker for almost a century and a half. Not only Norway's most, in, most famous painter, but a key figure in European modern art. He was also um, Europe's most influential, one of his most influential printmakers. He worked virtually nonstop throughout his entire career. He arranged his own exhibitions. He published artist statements. He gave interviews. He withstood public condemnation at times and enormous adulation at others. In other words, he was a really public figure. Munch was one of the most prolific self-portraitists in Western art. From his youth, when he determined that he would be a great painter, through the years of his first successes, when he portrayed himself, for example, um, on the left-hand side of the screen, screen in 1895 in Berlin in an oil painting, um, which you see a kind of a mysterious Bohemian Cafe Doyen on the left. And then again, in the same year in a lithograph, portraying himself as this sort of beautiful male face suspended between a skeletal arm and this inscription on top with his name and the date. Um, he presented himself to the public posing in various guises, assuming various personae. Sometimes he medicalized himself and his body as in a painting from 1902 to 1903, in which he represents a wounded man attended to by a nurse and a medical staff. This was a memory of an event that occurred in the summer of 1902 when a scuffle with his long-term lover, Tilla Larson, um, ended in the firing of a pistol, mutilating one of his fingers. The painting is a memory reconstruction of the artist's operation and hospitalization in which he's the naked, vulnerable spectacle of the medical viewing audience in the background. He transmuted this memory of wounding into a series of paintings entitled The Death of Marat, which allegorized his wounding, fictitiously turning his friend Tilla Larson into the French revolutionary Charlotte Corday and aligning himself with the French revolutionary Jean-Paul Marat murdered in his bathtub by Corday um, and memorialized in this painting on the left by Jacques-Louis David. In 1908 to nine, when the artist sought treatment for a medical collapse in the private Copenhagen clinic of Dr. Daniel Jakobsen, Munk painted and exhibited this self-portrait on the left to mark his departure from the clinic, signaling to his audience that he'd recovered. And of course, when he entered into the critic, uh, into the clinic, he'd been the subject of headline news, much as celebrities are today. And in 1919, he represented himself as a victim of the flu pandemic, exhibiting this life-sized oil painting after the second spike of the pandemic in his hometown of Christiania, the older name for the city of Oslo. And there are so many more self-portraits. This was a life lived in public. This was an artist who made image after image that registered or sometimes fictionalized his own private circumstances. But in contrast, most tiny private amateur photographs are little keyholes into his existence. Sometimes, as in this little photograph that you see on the right-hand side of the screen, a Dr. Jakobsen's clinic, his snapshots related to his larger works in oil paint or graphic media, as in the portrait, the self-portrait that I showed you a moment ago. But his photographs provided him with a space also for private performance, and they are, in effect, images of the artist's time away from his large exhibitable works, away from his public exhibitions, time without the pressure of public commissions, for that reason alone, his photographs are interesting. For example, in the one on the left, the artist poses with one of his nurses at the clinic as she seems to serve him a tray of food. And you'll note the partially finished oil painting that you saw a moment ago in the background here. Monk seems to be looking at the painting while the nurse looks at him and we 
look at them. His best known self image from the clinic recapitulates or recreates or mimes or perhaps parodies um, his Marat motif, naked but for a cloth draped over his hip and positioned on a diagonal, taking advantage of the funneling perspective caused by the proximity of his upper body to the camera, Monk positioned himself next to a bathtub, perhaps associating himself, <clears throat> excuse me, with the dead Marat, with his paintings of that theme. But the photographs are also fascinating in their materiality, in the artist's experimental approach to picture taking. For he seems to have treated photography and his few forays into cinema as extensions of his formal exploration of painting and printmaking, as noted earlier. Even in his private moments, the artist experimented with his own image and with image making itself. Monk purchased his first camera in 1902. It had been identified, it has been identified as the popular and portable Kodak Bullseye Number no. 2, uh, an example of which is actually included in this exhibition. He mostly photographed himself. Kodak handheld cameras had only been invented in, or marketed in 1888, triggering a rage in amateur photography, and Monk was one of those amateurs. He seems to have owned and uh, used also a Kodak home developing kit marketed by Eastman Kodak to um, excited amateurs to be able to do it yourself. Among his first images are those picturing himself, which he sent to his aunt back at home. These were taken in his rooms in Berlin amidst the paintings that he exhibited at the Berlin Zezession, as well as a strategically uh, placed palette, which you can see hanging behind his head. I like these paint this photographs very much as they demonstrate a, a, a kind of quirky, um, um, excuse me a second, a few quirky things about Monk as a photographer. Clearly the artist pushed aside some detritus from a tabletop on which he located the camera far enough back that the table surface is legible in the photograph as I discussed a moment ago. He sat before his camera and moved slightly, possibly to cover the camera lens during the time exposure. The cutoff foreground and the resulting slight blurring of the artist's image are photographic mistakes typical of an amateur first using a handheld camera. When Monk held his first a, a one-man exhibition in Christiania in September of 1902, he seems to have recorded the occasion with photographs perhaps taken with his new camera with someone else holding it across the room. In one photograph, the gallery appears animated including three men crowding the background. Monk stands beside a, beside a large canvas, hands in his coat pockets, facing the camera, and perhaps having swayed laterally back and forth, he appears to be a blur. Toward the center of the photograph, and I'm showing you a detail here on the left, toward the center of the photograph is a gentleman who, having moved during the exposure time, seems to have two right arms. And all the way to the left is a gentleman um, whose head completely disappears as he moved while looking at some of Monk's uh, graphic works. The artist had an incredibly astute eye for detail and one guesses that the ghost, the transparency and the occluded images appealed to him, appealed to his sensibility. And um, those are exactly the mistakes that he continued to explore for years in his photography. What likely therefore began in this way as errors or mistakes, when Monk moved from his fixed position to become a ghost or a, a blur, became a repeated exploration of bodily transparency in his photography. Because the camera he had held options for both a snapshot to accommodate uh, beneficial illumination um, and for timed exposure to accommodate low light levels, the, the apparatus offered the opportunity for blurred or transparent subjects caught in motion. In self-portrait after self-portrait, Munk moved during the timed exposures, resulting in an ongoing ghosting or dematerialization of his body, as in the one on the left, in which you can see the background um, through his head, or a later image from around 1930 on the right, in which you see his own paintings more solidly than you can see his face. 
in a photograph taken with his housekeeper in Varnamunde, Germany, in around 1907, Monk is less physically palpable than the sofa on which he sits, and yet detailed clearly as though he timed his appearance to register with clarity on his film and then ducked down uh, so he'd be out of sight and appear as a transparency. His face becomes embedded in the wood paneling in the background. He is transparent. The photographs um, such as this one are tiny and really require close looking on our part to see his subversion of his own physical image. Now with the rise of amateur photography, such blurring was the topic of popular caricature. I'm showing you here one of the photographs that Monk took. It's not in the exhibition, but he's just a smudge. In his 1855 satirical instruction manual for photographers, the British satirist Cuthbert Bede parodied the frequency of a subject moving during a long exposure uh, photograph. His example was, quote, portrait of a very beautiful young lady who had the misfortune to sneeze at the moment of the removal of the lens cap, end of quote. When you moved, you disappeared. The Kodak instruction booklet accompanying the bullseye number two camera attempted to guide amateurs through such mistakes of camera use. For example, prescribing the proper positioning of the camera on a stable surface and the exact timing and positioning required so that quote, the figure would show in relief would be solid. Monk's practice did the exact opposite. Absolute failure will result if the smallest stop is used for snapshots. I've here highlighted this sentence in this little manual. Kodak warned amateurs not to do these things, but Monk's practice did the opposite. Um, absolute failure. Well, in fact, Monk always used his camera against the grain, exploring error upon error for their paradoxical effects. Um, the art historian Ernst van Alphen has recently termed this approach failed photography in the sense of engaging the counter practices, uh, photographs that fail to comply with the dominant notion of photography as a recording device. As you make your way through the exhibition, you'll see Monk again and again as a transparency, as, um, as in the one on the right, which is also stained by oil paint or some other substance. Um, in which the artist's own image um, is transparent and his work shows through his ghosted body. That's on the right. Mistakes and transparencies were also widespread in studio photography in which impatient subjects such as a child moved during the course of a sitting, rendering them blurred, or as in one of Monk's own family photographs on the left. And that is a photograph of baby Monk. The vignetting of the image partly erased the figure, presumably his mother standing by his side, up positioned at the end of the frame. But um, through double printing or movement in time exposure, photography materialized ghosts and spirits with great regularity. Arne Egham has demonstrated Monk's interest in spirit photography, including images such as these, from William Mumler's studio in Boston, likely, which likely shaped Monk's photographic imaginary. The spiritualist movement was strong in Christiania, among whose adherents were in fact the vicar of Monk's family's church. While living in Berlin in the 1890s, Monk is said to have borrowed a dense volume of collected reports and anecdotes of spirit presences in photography, including photography, and Monk claimed to have read that book in one night. He was also a close friend of the uh, playwright August Strindberg, who was fascinated by transparency. Ghosts were the stock and trade of middle-brow entertainment, offering both the frisson of pleasure in the supernatural and prompting novel technologies of vision and projection. Tom Gunning's pioneering work has demonstrated the entanglement of spirit photography with the rise of cinema and other popular entertainments, as well as uh, scientific investigations of invisibility. He points out that the coincidence of spirit photography, in fact, um, enabled ways of thinking about other technologies that render invisible forces visible and made them strange. And among the new technologies of 
the revelation of the invisible was the X-ray, the evidence of, quote, death hidden between, beneath the skin. In 1902, Monk's hand was X-rayed following that altercation with a pistol that I mentioned earlier, in which a bullet shattered one of his fingers. The X-ray made before his surgery at Christiania's Rix Hospitala reveals the bullet lodged in his finger, which you see here. X-rays of hands had become the most popular of so-called invisible motifs after Wilhelm Röntgen published his discovery of what he termed X-rays in 18, late 1896. At the same time that X-rays began to enter into the field of medical diagnosis, Röntgen rays became a cultural phenomenon, um, prompting what was called X-ray fever. Within a short period of time, nearly 50 serious books and over a thousand articles had been published about X-rays in both scientific and spiritistic literatures. Among them, X-rays were sumptuously aestheticized in a portfolio published in January of 1896 by two Austrian experimenters. The photogravures included in the book, which you see here before you, um, made the inner structures of a number of animals and materials visible, while at the same time limbing their outer cores. In these photographs, you can see both the inside and the outside simultaneously two different registrations of being. And it's here where I wanna to return to that photograph of Mook disappearing into his sofa um, and the back wall interrupting his face. Mook was an extraordinarily canny image maker. In his woodcuts, Mook chose to carve his wooden planks along the grain, emphasizing the wood patterning as wood patterning, and also as a constitutive element in the motifs that he produced. He, he also used a fret saw to divide some of his blocks, coloring the pieces separately and then fitting them together like a jigsaw puzzle to print them. And it, as in these versions of his motif, Evening Melancholy from 1896, you can see the wood graining interrupting the figure of the man, the, the flesh of the face on the left. But for a moment, I wanna focus on the motif Moonlight One, a woodcut you see on the right-hand side of the screen, also of 1896. The woodcut is a variation of a painted motif that Monk made on the left in 1893. The painting is full of reversals and subversions. It's a view of a woman before a fence, behind which is a yellow house, and to the right, to the right, and foliage to the left. As in the woodcut, the woman wears a, a kind of a horizontal hat. Hard to see, I think, both in these slides. But what appears to be a dense shadow cast behind this woman um, is of a narrow profile at the apex and not the horizontal hat. At the lower left, there's a little red object, which may or may not be the hint of another, of an arm, of another human presence, and which may or may not cast the shadow behind the woman. The face of the woman, in fact, in the painting on the left, is blurred and bleached um, in the, it, so that you're looking at her as though through a scrim. Consequently, the shadow in the painting on the left has greater presence than the woman herself as a bounded entity. It's one of many works by the artist that reverses or subverts the expected hierarchy of our selected, uh, selective attention, a provocative game of sight that he in turn explored in his photography. The subversions likewise inhabit the woodcut version of the motif moonlight in which variations in color, paper and pressure on the matrices result in different capacities for the woman's face to be articulated or even present at all. In inking the striations of wood, Monk duly made the medium and the material of printmaking visible and he dematerialized his manifest subjects. His figures in such a print as Moonlight One bleed into the background, making the image coalesce and dissolve into the physical matter of paper and ink and the imprint of wood. Of Monk's woodcuts, the motif, the kiss, is extraordinary for its economy of form of the two bodies melded into one and for the ways in which the imprint of wood both frames and enters the bodies. <clears throat> 
in two in earlier impressions and two impressions of an 1897 version of the kiss, the bodies dissolve into each other and actually into the wood and into the paper. They become ghosted. And it's here, looking at the emphatic wood impressions, the melted bodies, the bodies disappearing into wood, and considering Monk's strategy of replacing the representation of corporeal bodies with print media that I believe he transmuted his strategies of printmaking into his amateur photographs in which he again and again disappears into his work. These may be scruffy little photographs, but they represent the accomplished work of a printmaker. In his early photographs, Munk also played printmaker using his home developing kit by um, de developing his negatives and then flopping them to experiment with mirror imaging with different ways in which his motifs would appear. Um, he had created mirrored images from a flop negative when he posed for his camera in 1906 in this image, moving during the time exposure so as to become partially translucent. We can see right through his head. On the beach in Varnamunda, Germany in 1907, Munch photographed himself with his model, Rosa Meissner, doubling the image and then flopping the negative, which holds his fingerprint in the emulsion to create a, a mirror imaged print. In fact, several of his photographic prints from this period between 1902 and 1910 hold his fingerprints, none more poignant than an image that he took of the backyard of his childhood home, um, the place where his mother had died when Munch was five years of age. Due to the movement of the camera during the exposure time, um, the small yard behind the apartment building um, is out of focus possibly an intentional use of mobility of the camera to create the blur, or possibly the discovery of a poeticized blurring emerging from his developing tank, the photograph became in a sense, a kind of symbolic image or symbolist print. An inscription on the back of the print reads, outhouse window, 30 to 40 years old, photograph of Pilas the 30, which was his home address. And then he wrote a swan on the wall. Monk played with focus, with the timing of his cameras, with the Kodak prints as graphic devices, but also many of his images include shadows that intrude into the foreground. Monk demonstrated a lifelong love of shadow play. Amorphous shadowed presences inhabit numerous works by Monk. <clears throat> including Starry Night from 1893, which you see on the left-hand side of the screen, and revisitations of that earlier motif from the mid-1920s on the veranda stairs and Starry Night over on the right. In some works, shadows occupy such a prominent position that they seem to be independent characters. They're surely agents of perception and interpretation, perhaps no more so than in the, puberty, the motif puberty, in which the shadow or the absence of light becomes a palpable entity. A shadow without a corresponding material body is a formula for mystery or horror. I thought I'd throw this in because Halloween's coming up. Untethered from its owner, a shadow is a disquieting doppelganger, um, ambiguous as an identity, as in Monk's paintings of the veranda or threatening, as in one of cinema's most terrifying shadows in Murnau's Nosferatu, the, the film Nosferatu, a symphony of horror released in 1922. As in his paintings, Monk frequently substitutes shadows for human presences uh, in his photographs, framing scenes with a light source at his back and therefore casting shadows onto his manifest subjects, Monk cannily inserted self-portraits into pictures that seem to be about something else entirely. A shadow falling across the legs of his models, Rosa and Olga Meissner, in a photograph taken on the beach in Varnamunda, uh, for example, explores the intersection of the physical bodies of the models and the dematerialized and implied body of the artist. And in the 1930s, my favorite of Monk's photographs, his shadowed presence on the right accompanies his dog, Phipps, in a kind of self-portrait of the absent artist. <clears throat> 
Now, <laughs> excuse me. This is one of the photographs that Monk took in his home and studio between 1927 and 1930. There's, mu uh, there's much to say about the earlier photographs, but I now want to turn to these later ones and then to cinema and then to conclude. <clears throat> I show here one photograph that we did not include in the exhibition, but I want it to help us, uh, to help to orient us to some of Monk's 1930 photographs and their backstories. Excuse me for a sec. <clears throat> The artist is seated, I'm talking about the photograph on the left. The artist is seated and having moved his hand and head during the uh, exposure time, he's transparent and even ghost-like. Through his flickering image, we see a painting divided at its center. The painting has both a was, was actually both a medical illustration and a pictorial invention. And I'm showing it to you on the right. In this watercolor composition, on the right, which appears in the photograph on the left, the figure of a man lies in bed, his head resting against a pillow with one hand raised to his face. Before him hovers a large skull. Below is a circular form floating against a pale background. Monks on the left, Monk's ghostly eye overlaps the edge of the painting. And in it, the skull is painted, in, in the original painting, the skull is painted a deep blue and worked in layers to appear almost three-dimensional. This is one of about, uh, this painting on the right is one of about three dozen renderings that Monk made in a variety of media in the summer of 1930, when a blood vessel burst in his right eye, um, temporarily and terrifyingly nearly blinding him in that eye. Ordered to rest, but both fearful and fascinated by this ailment, Monk said about drawing and painting what he saw from inside his head, chronicling methodically the interrupted field of his vision. I'm showing you two of the images here. Like the figure he represented in bed a moment ago, he closed his left eye and for several months he painted and drew the scotoma or the blind spot, occluding the visual field in his right eye, associating uh, the forms that he saw on the interior with symbolic imagery, in, including that skull you saw. Monk wrote in June of 1930, quote, a large dark bird moved slowly in front of me with dark brown feathers, a vivid blue hue emanated from it that went over to green and then to a lovely radiant yellow ring. It moved about as I crossed the room and everything it touched with its colors moved. Serpents crawled, serpents in the most magnificent colors moved and twisted." End of quote. As noted in detail by art historian Inge Bjørgudsti, Monk's dark bird in June um, dissolved into a swarm of crows by September, all chronicled by the artist in large scale paintings in watercolor and crayon, in oil paint and in his notes. Monk's recording and interpretation of his potential in his retinal images provide a radical investigation of different registers of vision and embodiment for the artist. Some of the photographs in this exhibition, including this one, as noted by Monk, were taken during this eye affliction. And I imagine then that some of his images represent not just a playful use of the camera with his ghosting, his odd angles, his shadows and so on, but the use of the lens becomes a kind of third eye, a way of making himself present for himself, um, sometimes po uh, for himself, uh, registering what his right eye couldn't itself see. Sometimes he posed in ways that brought back memories of his older composition in these later years, in, around 1930. And this leads me to Monk's selfies taken with a small handheld with small handheld cameras that he again acquired in the 1920s about the size of a cell phone by the later 1920s exposure times were fast and cameras were palm sized tightly framed and likely using one or two mirrors to control the compositions that he made the artist posed outside of his home and studio he largely chose angles that emphasized his prominent chin of which he was very proud, 
stretching his neck slightly to firm the aging skin. And he experimented uh, with the appearance of a blank sky versus the diagonal lines of the enframing architecture. There's several of these selfies in the exhibition, but my favorites are two in which the artist held the identical pose, held up his camera, put on a hat, took off a hat, much like we do today, primping and priming himself for his close-up. Monk purchased a Pathé Baby Cinema camera in 1927, a small handheld portable device. And he shot sequences in Germany and in Norway. And I'm gonna show you a few short sequences. We're gonna note that he used his camera much as he did a paintbrush swooshing across the field of vision, uh, activating vision itself. I'm gonna show a couple of quick moments from his uh, sequence of short films. There's gonna be the loud sound of a projector. It's not, it's not another uh, mechanical failure. It is actually embedded in the PowerPoint. One gets a bit seasick from the fire hose shots, but marbles at the free use of the camera as a descriptive advice, as a technology of motion, the very definition of cinema itself. Now at the end of the sequence um, is another self-portrait, which I love. So bear with me as I seek the final sequence and we get to see Monk in action. Hopefully. Oh. There we go. It is the apple daisy wheel of death that I just had. Keep bearing with me. It's going to happen. So there we got to see Edvard Monk playing Charlie Chaplin, <laughs> the author, the author of the screen, having fun with his own image. It's also in this little cinematic fragment, <clears throat> a portrait of the artist, a self-portrait experimenting as he always did, with the tools in his hands and his self, himself as an experimental arena. In imagining the self, Monk was aware of the photograph as a retrospective enterprise, a rendering of what was. He wrote, I have an old camera with which I've taken countless pictures of myself often, he wrote, with amazing results. Someday when I'm old, he wrote, I have nothing better to do than write my autobiography. All my self-portraits will see the light of day again, end of quote. In their intervention into amateur photography, uh, privileging the visual mishap over visual effect. Their renderings of time over material, gesture over stasis, and kind of knowing over seeing. Monk's processions of practiced error are astonishing. And although these are little um, amateur photographs, they're incredible documents of an eye always at work. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, um, Patricia, for that wonderful talk. And um, I just want to encourage people to enter questions into the chat function. We've received a few, um, but maybe you want to start with uh, an image you just showed, um, oh, a sure. selfie. So it works again. Where, where Munk is, is making a duck face. You want the duck face? I love the, there's, how about duck face? Um, 
so, you know, I wonder he's, he's posing in a way that is ubiquitous, um, on Instagram and, um, and there's something about his photography that is universal and timeless. What do you think is distinctly of its day? Um, in these selfies, I guess the closest thing I'd say, these so-called selfies, um, I think they're very much of their day in around 1930. I think the, for example, the photographers of the Bauhaus in Germany and photographers who were doing radical experimental photography in, in um, the Soviet Union were practicing similar kinds of photographic work. Um, whether or not, I, I'm assuming that Munch was aware of these photographic experiments because they were so widely reproduced in in magazines and in exhibitions and they were discussed it sort of endlessly so i see these as kind of bauhaus related i have to say mm -hmm. and in the earlier photographs as i indicated i see them as very closely related to this whole new turn of the century world of invisibility that was so fascinating to um, artists and intellectuals thank you do, do you have other do you want to add to that um i I think that that is a perfect response. Um, I agree with you completely. And I, I do have a question from Sally Vermkrantz, who asks if Van Gogh was one of his major influences. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's a whole other um, conversation. Yes, absolutely. He very likely saw the work in one of his trips to Paris when he was um, there on um, scholarships in the 1880s. He knew the work certainly by the 1890s, very strongly um, transformative um, influence on Monk's work. So that was a great question. Um, Barbara Spaeth asks if um, the film was shot in 35 millimeters or 16, what format was the pate camera that he was using? Yeah, that was a 16 millimeter camera. I think it was the first, um, if I remember the right correctly, I think it was the first one that was really marketed to the to a um, you know broad general public, fairly inexpensive and really portable. Great. What informed your selection of the photographs in the exhibition? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, well, initially, both serendipity and also the size of the galleries at Scandinavia House, I have to say, um, given a lot more gallery wall, I'd have chosen a lot, many more photographs. But I chose the ones that I thought um, represented certain pressure points in Monk's photographic career and in his life. There are actually a whole series of photographs, too, in this exhibition of himself seeking health cures on the beaches of Germany and Norway. Um, I didn't talk about them now. But um, I, I love the informality, but also sometimes I was much, I was much engaged in the experimentation of his vision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so Stefan Rance asks, how large was his body of work, his photographic work? Um, there are, I think, about 230 prints that are um, in storage at the Moat Museum. They're not all independent. Um, uh, motifs often there are multiple prints that were made from the same negative but so it's a it's a it, it's not a massive body of work but it's a it's large enough that one could do a lot more investigation of them mm -hmm. um and uh jean or jean um asks if a, a virtual tour of this exhibition is available and it has recently uh been made available do you want to talk a little bit about that so yes, um, <coughs> pardon me, let me just get another mouthful of water here. So this exhibition was put with, uh, opened at the Munch Museum in Oslo in uh, shortly after the COVID shutdown in the spring. And um, so the Munch Museum fantastically turned the exhibition into a virtual exhibition. And if you go to the Munch Museum website, um, and actually, I think right on your website, Leslie, if you scroll all the way down to the bottom and you click on it, you can get into that virtual exhibition. And there are more photographs um, in that virtual exhibition than there are on the gallery walls here. And I will say, I find it very complicated to navigate. So you need, a, you need to get a little bit oriented because the photographs themselves are very mobile across your screen. Mm 
But once you click on them, you start to be able to bring them up and, and bring up um, some descriptions of them. Wonderful. And Ron asks, a photo in the exhibition titled Nurse in Black, Jacobson's Clinic of 1908 to 1909 looks similar to both a painting and print titled Death in a Sick Room dated 1896. Is the date wrong on the photo or is the photo inspired by the painting? Photo is inspired by the painting. I mean, I think again and again and again, Monk's photographs reach back into his earlier motifs and his earlier idea world. And also the posture of that particular nurse looks an awful lot like a couple of a famous, uh, a well-known portrait that he made of his sister also mm -hmm. uh, at the beginning of the 1890s. Okay, thank you. So I have one more question about your archival resources. What was most valuable to you as you were researching this exhibition? Oh, well, that's a great question. This can get deep in the weeds and nerdiness. Um, but I first saw the photographs in the 1980s when I was a graduate student. And so that was the most important moment for me was first seeing these things and knowing that they existed. Um, you know, over many years, and also I saw the cinema fragments for the first time too in the 1980s when I was a grad student. And um, I've spent years and years and years reading Monk's letters and reading his notebooks, um, looking at his motifs, trying to explore his um, uh, the ways that he actually produced his work. And I'd say all of that together, I found very helpful in, in um, examining these photographs. But his, um, he had a lot to say, he wrote a lot. But I also, as I said at the beginning of the talk, really wanna honor some of the, histor the art historians who have done previous work on the photographs. That meant a lot too. Thank you so much. This was really wonderful. I can't, I can't express my gratitude enough, uh, Pat. And I just want to say before we close that we have some other exhibition related programs um, that are virtual can, you can enjoy. So on November 8th, we are hosting an, an Edvard Munch through the lens of Henrietta's eye. It is a virtual um, workshop and lecture on um, alternative photographic processes. On January 14th, we'll host the lecture Head to Head, Edvard Munch, August Strindberg, and Photographic Self-Representation. The lecture will be delivered by Linda H. Rugg, who is the Associate Vice Chancellor for Research and Professor of Swedish Literature in the Scandinavian Department at University of California, Berkeley. And on January 21st, Caring and Curing, Edvard Munch in the Clinic, 1908 to 1909, which is a lecture delivered by Dr. Alton Moorhead, an associate professor of art history at Queen's University. Visit our website, nordicmuseum.org, for more information and registration. Thank you all for joining us, and especially thanks to you, Pat. Thank you for the honor of speaking. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.